I took a factory job. Not quite sure what's going on here. By Mr. Outlaw. I never should have dropped out of college. The difference between Zuckerberg and I is astronomical, but I was delusional enough to think otherwise. I wasn't completely hopeless, though. I had an idea of what I wanted to become. Well, that's irrelevant here. This is the story about how I ended up at the factory. I was living by myself in San Antonio at the time. My folks were kind enough to give me a bit of moving out cash, and I was also working part-time during school. That's how I'd been sustaining myself. But as much as I loved them, there was no way in hell that I was moving back in. That just wasn't an option. After taking up a few temporary stints around the city, the bills started piling up. In addition to that, I had also been fired from my part-time job. Not that it mattered too much, I was just making peanuts there. I started looking everywhere, trying to secure another steady source of income. But that turned out to be quite the process. As the bills started stacking, so did my rejection emails. At first, I was being selective, trying to land something that was considerably higher than minimum wage. That was just wishful thinking. In the end, I decided to settle for a $9 an hour gig at a local restaurant. But then I found something better. A lot better. It was a singular flyer taped to the side of a bus stop shelter. I looked it over and was put into a state of absolute incredulity. We're looking for some hard-working individuals to help out in our new factory. Starting rates are $21 an hour. Please email or give us a call if you think you're up to the task. No previous warehouse experience required. That last one got me. No fucking experience needed. Now, if I was smarter, then I could have seen where this was going. If something's too good to be true, you know the rest. But I suppose that desperate times don't only yield desperate measures. They also make you disregard the concept of reality. I decided to give them a call later that day. I thought I'd show more initiative than sending an email. I don't know. After a few rings, a younger sounding woman picked up the phone. Hello, this is the Dolus Company. Marie speaking. How may I help you today? I tried to do a quick recollection in my head. Had I ever heard about a Dolus Company? I hadn't. But it's not like I'd know about every company in Texas, so this wasn't an immediate cause for concern. The phone call went surprisingly well. A bit too well, in retrospect. But hey, desperate times. Things were starting to look up. That morning, I drove out to the factory address. It was kind of on the outskirts of town, but that wasn't the biggest problem. It was only a 25-minute drive, and there would be little traffic on the way there. I suppose that you could call the place medium-sized. I mean, I haven't seen too many factories in real life, so it's hard to make an apt comparison. It was located on the side of a narrow road, right next to two large cornfields. I parked in the lot adjoining to the road which was about three quarters full. I got out of my car, straightened my tie, and slicked back my hair one more time before walking in. The lady had told me to go to the manager's office, which was apparently located to the left of the entrance as soon as I walked in. I found it easily enough. The door was closed, so I knocked. And knocked. I must have stood there for about five minutes, but nobody answered. At first, that is. Assuming that the guy was simply Blaine, I took a seat on the chair directly parallel to the door. However, I was surprised when I started hearing movement coming from inside. It sounded like shuffling of feet, along with multiple hushed voices conversing. Eventually, the door opened up, and I was met with a tall, bulky man dressed less casually than me. He shook my hand and kindly introduced himself as Winston. When I walked into his office... I'd realized it was only the two of us in there. I could have sworn that I'd heard somebody else. But maybe not. I contemplated asking about it for the briefest moment, but I decided there was no benefit to doing so. We sat down, and he began asking me some questions. Most of them were regarding my physical strength and endurance. I was in pretty good shape myself, 
and that was evident from my not-so-subtle wardrobe choices. So those were no problem. In fact, everything seemed fine about the whole process. No red flags just yet. Aside from the bizarre delay in time that it took him to open the door for me. I was supposed to come in at 7am the very next day. Early start, but whatever, beggars can't be choosers. It was a generic place, with assembly line production and heavy machinery sprawled across the wide concrete floors. I was given a rundown of exactly what I'd be doing and how to do it. The factory's production was mostly focused on vehicle accessories, like trailer hitches. However, my job was even easier than I initially thought it was going to be. Since I had a forklift license, all that I had to do was transport materials from one end of the factory to the other. It was hardly strenuous, and for the first few days, I'd estimate that I was only actually spending about two and a half hours driving back and forth. The other five and a half simply comprised of waiting around for somebody else to finish sealing the shipping boxes. I actually managed to get a hefty amount of reading in, which was great. But I don't want to hear about all this. To summarize, the job was a cakewalk for the first few weeks. The only peculiar thing that I'd really noticed was the fact that a lot of other workers sparsely ever spoke to me or even each other. My interactions were limited mostly to two other guys that had been hired. Chad and Sergio. They were chill enough, and our conversations were about as normal as you could expect for three dudes in their early twenties working at a factory. It was during the third week where the first interesting occurrences began to manifest. I was doing my usual rounds when I noticed one of the assembly line workers sitting absolutely still. Now, I expected them to take breaks. They were human, after all. But this woman simply wasn't moving. I observed her apparent detachment as vehicle lighting fixtures slowly moved past her. The bizarre part was that her posture remained impeccable. I slowly drifted towards her trying to get a glimpse of what she might be looking at. As I made my way past her, it looked to me as if she was simply staring at a spot on the wall parallel to her. I took a quick glance over, but I couldn't seem to locate anything worth staring at. I mean, it was just a wall. After a few moments of contemplation, I came to the conclusion to leave. I mean, we all zone out sometimes, don't we? If that doesn't sound particularly strange to you, I can guarantee you that this encounter was only scratching the surface. After that, a few days had gone by in which nothing noteworthy had occurred. But then I saw him for the first time. An individual which I can only describe as... The Suit. I was taking one of my breaks when he appeared at the top of the stairs connecting to the next floor. Now, I was instructed to never go up there. Winston had told me that there would be no situation where I'd ever need to go up there. So I had no idea what was actually above us. He was a tall, somewhat wiry man, wearing a three-piece dark blue suit. Maybe it was just light black. To be honest, I couldn't tell for sure. On the surface, this would have been a nothing situation. He was just probably the supervisor or something. But what kind of supervisor wears a face mask? I mean, the guy was wearing a plain black face mask with what looked like black goggles on top. Black gloves as well. From the bits of exposed skin that I saw, it was evident that he was pale. Extremely pale. I looked up at him in moderate bewilderment, trying to gauge who he was supposed to be. Nearly had a heart attack when Winston grabbed my shoulder, pulling my gaze away from the suit. Hey Jeff, you keeping busy? Yeah, I'm just waiting for the next set of boxes to transport. Great. You know, in the meantime, you could probably help them pack it all in. Keeps everything moving nice and steady. Um, sure. He gave me a smile before inching past me and walking off. I looked back up, only to see the suit walking back through wherever he came from. I also saw Winston making a beeline towards the stairs, climbing them with a haste that I'd never seen him operate at before. In fact, his movements almost looked... angry. He went the same way that the suit did, and I never saw him again that day. Obviously, some questions were raised here. Like, who the hell was that guy, and 
Why did Winston seem so intent on me not seeing him? But I wasn't going to ask. For some reason, that didn't seem like such a great idea. I decided to simply keep my head low and do my damn job. Whatever was really going on, I wasn't about to get involved with that. As the day was ending, I was prepared to clock out. One of the janitors nudged me as I walked past him. Excuse me? I muttered out in surprise. Keeping his voice extremely low, he whispered to me. Did he look at you? I was lost for a second, but only a second. It's pretty obvious who he was talking about. No, I don't think so. The janitor just nodded at this. Okay, just don't look at him. I tried asking him some more about this, but he simply told me that he was busy and couldn't talk. Okay, what the hell was going on here? Those were the first few weeks. I still don't know what the woman was staring at or who this suit is, but hopefully I'll never find out. I've read stories like this, and they never end well. Alright, you, you know how I said that I was going to lay low? Well, nothing ever goes perfectly, does it? Since one of the other forklift drivers had called in sick to a night shift, I had to fill in his place. The shift itself was from midnight to 8am. Extremely obscure hours, but it also paid 25% more, so I didn't complain. In addition to that, there were considerably less workers, which... Consequently, meant less work I actually had to do. I was probably on the forklift for ten minutes per hour. The day was so slow that Winston decided to have me do inventory at the back room. Easy enough. It was just supposed to count bumpers. But the room itself... That was something to be desired. The floors were cracked and dusty while the only sources of illumination came from the few incandescent bulbs dangling precariously above me. It is what it is, I thought. Before I started counting, I decided to take a look around the place. There was a singular locked door to one side, as well as a window on the other. The room that the window led to was presumably pitch black, as I could see nothing through it. I didn't realize how bizarre this really was until about ten minutes in. There was a window, but no door leading into the room. Not unless the door on the other side was connected. But then that would have to be one large room. I went back over to the window and tried looking through it again, mostly out of sheer curiosity. It was so dark that it honestly could have been completely covered and I wouldn't have noticed. After about two minutes of intense staring... A knock from behind it made me jump. At first, I thought it come from the entrance, but that was wide open, and nobody was there. There was only one other door in the room. Three more heavy, rhythmic knocks rang through, confirming that it was indeed coming from the locked one. At that moment, I didn't know what to do. So I froze. Three more knocks. But there was another sound as well, almost like tapping on glass. I turned around, catching what I could only assume was a hand pressed on the window for a split second. I just made up the inventory numbers and left the room after that. I'm not going to quit just yet. The chances of a better opportunity popping up somewhere else is slim. I'll just tough it out. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not in any immediate danger. Hell... It looks as if this factory has been open for years. It can't be that bad if people keep working here, right? Right? But if anything else happens, I guess I'll take note of it. I suppose that this will serve as a follow-up to my original post. I've realized some stuff. Things that weren't immediately apparent, but after a bit of introspection, seem quite disconcerting. Winston is weird. Not personality-wise, though. 
I don't know what to call it. In a metaphysical sense, maybe? I mean, he's always there when I am. I don't have constant hours either. They range from 6 to 10 hours per day, but usually aren't in the same window of time. What I mean by that is sometimes I could be working 9 till 5, other days could see me go from 7 till 2, or this from 11 till 7. You see what I mean? The thing is, Winston's always there, both when I clock in and out. Unless he inexplicably has the same hours as me, not likely for a man in his position, this is not normal. But there could be an explanation for this. He's a workaholic. Those exist, don't they? But I just don't see anybody working that much. I met up with Sergio at a bar after work one day. We've gotten quite close, by the way. And we started discussing this. Now, I'd just finished an 11 to late shift. Sergio had essentially just woken up, after finishing a shift from 1 to 10 a.m. Could you guess what he told me? Winston was there the whole time. He was also there the whole time for me. 1 a.m. to 8 p.m. That's 19 hours. Don't tell me anybody works 19 hours a day. What was weirder was that after all this time, we weren't exactly sure what Winston even did there. I mean, he didn't spend much time in his office. He'd either be walking around the ground floor, going up to the second, or simply disappearing completely somewhere in the back, only to come back a few hours later. Now, I'd never worked a managerial position, so I can't say for sure what he should have been doing. But it sure as hell must involve phone calls or paperwork or something. But he never seems to be doing that. Our conversation moved on to other things that we found questionable about our respective situations. I told him about the inventory room and the man in the suit. However, those paled in comparison to what he told me. He was having a smoke by his car one day when he saw a woman coming out of the factory, seemingly bawling her eyes out. He called out to her, but she just ignored him and continued running away right into the adjacent cornfield. He decided to go after her. After a few minutes of trying to track her through the crops, he stumbled into a clearing. There was a singular, run-down shack in the middle. He could still hear the woman crying. With his guard up all the way, he walks in there. He finds the woman crouched in the corner, seemingly looking for something on the ground. He calls out to her. Excuse me, ma'am. You all right? She turns around, face absolutely drenched in tears. Who are you? Just... just go away. A few seconds later, she pushes down onto a section of the floor, revealing a set of stairs. Before she starts climbing down, she turns around to face him and says, Don't look at the man in black. And just like that, she was gone. The floor returned to its original form, and Sergio was left standing there alone, not knowing what to think. He didn't try investigating further. He considered mentioning it to Winston, although that never came to fruition. But here's the really fucked up part. That woman was back at work the next day. Sergio said that they made brief eye contact, but that there was no reciprocation or familiarity in her stare. Again, he thought about talking to her about it, but he didn't. There was another instance where he wanted to talk to Winston about changing one of his shifts. Since Sergio couldn't find him anywhere, he tried his office. He knew that somebody was in there, because he could hear what sounded like a muffled conversation through the door. He froed his brow as he told me this part. It was muffled, but a bit too much. Anyhow, he knocked on the door for several minutes, but nobody bothered to answer. In fact, the conversation seemed to be getting louder with every knock. At some point, he simply walked away. He bumped into Winston a few minutes later. He wasn't terribly surprised. I mean, there was a tangible explanation for something like this. Some supervisors from a different branch could have been using his office for some kind of meeting. But... 
that didn't seem to be the case here. Sergio told him that he'd tried knocking, assuming that Winston was there, but the guys inside never answered. He told me that Winston's face instantly morphed into one of horrific anger upon hearing this. How many did it sound like were in there? was his immediate response to this. Sergio answered with, A couple. And Winston took off storming. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? But that wasn't even the worst experience. That came on one of his night shifts. It was about 3am, and he was getting ready to leave after a strenuous 10 hours. At that point, the place was pretty empty. He started heading out towards his car when he spotted something out of the corner of his eye. It was partially obscured by the cornfield, but it looked like a person. Obviously, the features were pretty much impossible to distinguish from that distance and at that time, but he told me that it almost looked like the person was wearing a mask. They briefly stared at each other, before the figure started fucking running towards him. Sergio freaked out and bolted towards his car. He got in, fumbling around for his keys, before finally managing to stick it in the ignition. But by that time, the person had caught up to him. He said that they launched themselves onto the hood of his car, slightly cracking his windshield. That's when he got a closer look at the guy. Now, he couldn't exactly tell whether or not this guy was wearing a blank mask, or if he had no face. Again, it was dark. He told himself to believe the former. Sergio was in sheer shock, unable to function or even think. The person started banging on his windshield, producing more cracks and also a bit of blood. It was at this point where a group of extremely large men in security gear came out of nowhere specific and yanked the guy off. One of them told Sergio to sit still, while the others dragged their attacker away, back into the cornfield. They told Sergio that they were the nighttime security for the factory, and that the man who charged at him was a mental patient that escaped from a nearby hospital. But there were two things wrong with that, he told me. First of all, there is no nighttime security. I've worked these shifts before, you think I would have seen them by now? Second, there is no mental hospital within 500 miles of here. So who the hell was that guy? During his following shift, Winston came up to him, apologized for the incident, and told him that he'd personally pay out of the pocket for his windshield repairs. But he didn't seem to want to answer any more questions about it. All this, just from a few weeks of working here. So why don't you just leave? This shit is beyond fucked, I told him, as we were getting ready to depart. He responded by giving me a solemn-sounding chuckle. I think it'll be alright. I mean, it has to be. I've got no other options. Nobody else is going to hire me after what I've done. In the kindest way possible, I tried asking him what that was. Something bad, was his only reply. Guess that was a subtle message for me not to press any further with it. It's weird. During the entire time we were sitting at the bar... I could have sworn that somebody was watching us. I couldn't narrow it down to a single person, but the feeling was there nonetheless. That feeling persisted on my walk home, but this time, I could see him. It was a man, hood up and head downwards as he trailed me. I stopped, getting ready to confront him, when he simply brushed by me, but not before slipping a piece of paper into my hand. On it was a phone number and a message. The Dollar's company isn't real. Call me. When I got home, I considered doing so, but I couldn't come to a personal consensus. I mean, what if calling him would only introduce additional problems? I decided to refrain from doing so, for the time being at least. When I clocked into work the next day, I was approached by Winston. He called me into his office, gushed about how good of an employee that I'd been, and offered me a three dollar an hour raise. I was incredulous at this. I mean, he'd literally caught me dicking around on multiple occasions. None of this made any sense. 
but I just thanked them and went along with that. During my break, I decided to send the guy who bumped into me a text. He never responded. After work, I decided to give him a call, but was directed to an automated voice stating that the number was not in service. Things are getting weird here. Trying to find a method to the madness of this place seems like a daunting and admittedly horrifying task. But I'll stick around for now. Maybe look a bit further into this. I mean, hell, maybe the Dolus Company isn't real. But the money sure is. I think I'll talk to Chad next. See what he has to say. I've been trying to get in contact with Chad, but it's been hell trying to do so. I haven't been seeing him at work. Apparently, Sergio hasn't seen him since the second week. If he quit, then that was understandable, but I decided to ask Winston about it anyways. His response was... unexpected. Chad? Nah, i never known Chad before. I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. He claimed that he'd never hired a man named Chad, but he did. I know this. Sergio knows this. I can't understand why he would lie about something like this. Well, actually, I do. There's an obvious answer here, but I don't like to entertain that possibility. In any case, it seems as if trying to contact Chad will only yield dead ends. I don't know his phone number or anything, so fuck it. There's more interesting avenues to explore here. Remember the woman who kept staring at the wall? Well, it happened again. This time with an older man. I remember driving around when I saw him. Motionless, eyes transfixed on nothing obvious. It was in the exact same spot that the woman was. I decided to look into this myself. It was about 1.30am, 30 minutes before my shift was supposed to end. It was pretty slow, so I walked over to the wall and tried to figure out what the hell was going on here. Trying to be as discreet as possible, I looked and felt around there, trying to find something that resembled an anomaly. At first, I couldn't fathom what they could be staring at. I mean, it was just a damn wall. But, eventually, I figured it out. There was a small spot that was a different shade of white than the rest of the wall. At first, I thought it might have been a stain of some sort. I crouched down in an attempt to observe it better. That's when I realized it almost looked... shiny. Hard to explain, I hesitated for a moment before feeling it with my thumb. I can't even begin to describe the texture. It was slimy, hard, and rubbery all at the same time. In addition to that, my thumb began burning. It almost felt as if some caustic substance was eating away at my skin. I looked down at my thumb, expecting something horrendous. Inexplicably, it looked fine. In fact, the pain had even subsided. I looked back at the spot on the wall, but... It was gone. Instead, replaced with something else. A black spot now. However, it wasn't a spot. It was a hole. Hesitantly, I put my finger through it, before quickly pulling it back out, confirming this. So what in the hell did I just touch? I got back up and turned around, coming to the disturbing realization that all of the assembly line workers were now staring at me. It made sense. Everything had become quiet a while ago, but I was too distracted to think anything of it. I decided to leave early. I had a feeling that Winston wouldn't have cared. When I came in the next day, I tried to lay as low as possible, in an attempt to pretend that yesterday's events had never happened. It seemed to work. I did my rounds without doing so much as glancing over at the wall. Everything seemed alright. It was around 3am and I was having a smoke break outside. I made sure to watch out for any figures standing in the cornfields beforehand. Eventually, another guy came out and introduced himself as Matt. I was a bit jarred by this. None of my other co-workers had even talked to me before at this point, save for Sergio and Chad. 
The conversation started out normal enough. We talked mundane shit like weather and what we ate for lunch, but then he dropped the bomb on me. I saw you go up to the wall. Was it there? What was there? I asked in response. The thing. He just stares at me as if that answer was supposed to be descriptive enough. But I suppose that what he was talking about was obvious. Yeah, it was that. I even touched it. So what exactly is it? It's the way out of here. It's the way out of here. I've been here for 34 years. The expression on his face as he says this was beyond disturbing. This doesn't make any sense. He doesn't look older than 30. I wasn't prepared for what happened next. Matt storms back into the factory and I follow along. He disappears into a room near the back before coming out with a sledgehammer. Before I know it, he's hammering away at the wall, putting absolute exertion into every swing. It isn't long before they come out. What I can only assume was the security force that Sergio was talking about. Two men in gear, both looking to be six foot six or taller, rush down from the second floor, tackling Matt to the ground. As they drag him away to an unknown location, I can hear him screaming out. Let me go. Let me out of here. And just like that, they were gone. I look back at the now damaged wall. Through the cracks, I could see something moving around in there. But I have no idea what it is. A few moments later, Winston arrived, announcing that everybody was to go home early. But it was weird. Nobody moved as he said it. They all just stared at me. Eventually, the feeling of nauseating discomfort overtook my initial shock. I felt my mind starting to regain its bearings, forcing my legs to make their way towards the exit. Once outside, I started making a beeline towards my car. At that point, I wasn't sure whether or not I was coming back. Matt's words kept replaying in my head. I've been here for 34 years. It sent chills down my spine. Suddenly, going back to school didn't sound so bad. However, I nearly had a heart attack when I looked up. Somebody was standing on the hood of my car. I don't know why I didn't notice at first. Actually, I was pretty sure that they weren't there when I'd left the building. I halted to a stop about 30 meters from the vehicle. Since it was dark, making out details proved to be a difficult task. But the figure shifted slightly, allowing the moonlight to illuminate its features. Oh shit, I thought. It was the fucking suit. It started walking towards me, almost floating off the hood. As it got closer, it sounded as if it were talking, but not coherently. It was essentially just a rapid, low-pitched muffle. I flipped shit and started running the other way. As soon as I did so, I saw Winston storm out of the factory and begin sprinting towards me, holding a shotgun. At that moment, I thought I was fucked. As he got closer, Winston raised the weapon and fired off both rounds. I closed my eyes for a second, preparing myself for the impact. But it never came. Instead, the low-pitched muffle just got louder. Once my eyes were open again, I turned around to see Winston lunging at the suit, who now had some kind of black substance leaking out of its chest, where the bullets had presumably hit. As soon as I saw Winston throw the first punch, I scrammed. I started legging it out of there, away from the sounds of confrontation. As I got into and started my car, I took a peek through the rear view, watching as the suit crushed one of Winston's tree trunk-sized arms. I suppose that I felt kind of bad for flooring it out of there. But I couldn't have helped at that moment. I drove for about five minutes down the road before stopping and dialing 911. I mean, I had to do something. I just told them that somebody was being murdered at the factory address. I got home and started pacing around my apartment. Christ almighty, what the fuck just happened? 
I picked up the phone again to call Sergio, asking him when his next shift was. In 20 minutes, was his response. I'm driving there right now. Look, you need to turn the fuck around. What the hell? He interrupts me. I can hear police sirens and some kind of inhuman roar as his phone cuts off. It's only been 30 minutes since then. I locked my doors and barricaded my windows. I'm holding a Glock, but I have a feeling that it won't be so effective. But there's no way that suit knows where I live, right? Somebody just knocked on my door. It's Chad. I didn't answer the first few times that he knocked. I didn't want to. Jeff, open the fuck up and tell me what you found! I had no idea what he was referring to. I found a lot of stuff, after all. However, it turns out that he was only being polite by knocking. Within a few minutes, my door was down. It was so sudden that I yelped in shock. I don't even know what he did. The door just kind of fell over. I looked around my box of an apartment, trying to identify an escape route. But then I remembered I was on the 14th floor. Chad barges in and tells me that we have to go back to the factory. For the briefest second, I protest. But that never mattered. I wasn't getting out of this. He grabs my arm and pushes me out into the hallway. It seemed effortless for him. We get into his car and start driving. Once we get there, we're met with the familiar red and blue lights. A bunch of dead cops. There's some kind of bizarre, buzzing sound emanating from within the cornfields. It's almost like that ringing you hear in your ears when everything's absolutely silent. The more I sit still, the louder it is. But I don't like it. So I don't sit still. Chad seems to take a frantic look around of the place before getting out of the car. He rushes over to the trunk and pulls out what appears to be an extremely large and rather bizarre looking shotgun. And then he looks at me. Look. You're actually going to want my help, so don't fucking complain. You don't want to be stuck here forever, do you? This statement flusters me. What? What the hell are you talking about? He does a half chuckle, half scuff thing before saying, Let's go. I had no idea what he meant by that. But I was a bit too afraid to ask. We walked into the factory, which had its doors wide open. Everything was a mess. The assembly line was still running, but there were no workers there to take care of it. In fact, there was nobody there at all. I immediately directed my attention to the wall. I didn't know what he thought that I'd found, but I guess I had. Over there. That's where it is. Chad nods and we make our way over. From what we could tell, somebody had already tried breaking through. There was a damn jackhammer on the floor with the chisel completely busted. However, there were only a few cracks on the wall. I inspected further, eventually locating the hole. I pointed towards it. Right there. That's where I saw it. Chad does an impatient half nod before stepping backwards. He raises the shotgun before firing off two devastating sounding rounds. A few more cracks materialize, but no breakthrough. This ain't gonna work. He sounds angry. He looks around before gesturing towards the back room. Come on, I need your help here. For a second, I considered running away right there, but that never came to fruition. Without knowing what to do, I just followed him. We went into the same back room that I'd been in a few weeks prior. The one with the window and the door. I was expecting him to shoot the lock off or something, but he turned his immediate attention to the window instead, smashing it with the butt end of the gun. My earlier conjecture was correct. The room beyond the window wasn't dark. There was just black paper covering it, for whatever reason. We jumped through the window and find ourselves in some kind of long hallway but they flicker intermittently. As we progress further down, it becomes evident that the place branches off quite a bit. 
At this point, I have absolutely no idea what the hell we've just stumbled upon. Some time passes before we begin hearing something, like grunting in the distance. Chad stops and signals for me to do the same. It's getting louder. It's familiar. A deep, clear voice and a jumbled, indistinct one interlocked in conflict. Winston and the suit suddenly come tumbling out of the corridors in front of us. They're still fighting. In addition to losing his arm, Winston's missing one of his eyes, has an exposed ribcage and is limping on a singular leg. However, the suit's not faring much better. Half of his jaw has been torn off, exposing dark blue muscle and an array of pitch black teeth. His eyes, which are steely grey, are locked with Winston's single. But they both turn to face us when Chad cocks the gun backwards. Fucking hell. I didn't know he was here too. I hear him mutter. Chad fires off two shots at the both of them in rapid succession. Winston reacts first, ducking into an adjacent corridor whilst the suit takes the full brunt of the slug. He stumbles back, now clutching the cluster of holes in his chest. However, he's still standing. Chad's face drops. Fuck. In the time it takes him to reload, the suit has already lunged into our direct vicinity. He grabs one of Chad's wrists, crushing it with ease. Chad shrieks, but manages to use his other arm to swing the gun into the suit's exposed jaw, knocking out several teeth. Yeah, I didn't care what Chad said. But I wasn't sticking around. Now, absolutely lost and disorientated, I sprint through the confusing corridor, trying to find my way out of this fucking place. I guess I was going the wrong way because I found what I think Chad was looking for. I turned a corner, finding a door that looked like the one we'd come through. I barged through it, but nearly staggered back in shock at what was actually in there. A bunch of chained up, emaciated people with what I can only describe as a giant white screen at the opposite end. None of them even bothered to look at me. The weird part was, they didn't seem to be in pain. In fact, they didn't seem to react to anything at all. They're all just emotionless. Blank. At some point, I was beginning to think they were all inanimate. But upon closer inspection, it was pretty evident that they were indeed breathing, though incredibly subtly. One of the most disturbing parts were their eyes. No irises or pupils, just a solid off-white. Wait. I recognize these people. I'd seen them around work. They were my co-workers. I walked around, inspecting each one. My suspicions turned out to be true. I found Sergio. I tried shaking him, but he was unresponsive. He was so frail that it felt like I'd dislocated one of his shoulders right there and then. This was... nearly too much to handle, but I tried to keep my composure. It was what I saw next that sent me over the edge. Myself. Chained and emaciated, eyes white, just like everybody else. There was also a hole right next to me. A hole. It couldn't have been. What the hell was this? I pace around, trying to make a determination regarding what to do. However, my contemplation is cut short by the sounds of something coming up behind me. It's Winston, still inexplicably alive despite being devastatingly bloody and broken, now crawling on one arm towards me. He looks up and shakes his head. Everything would have been fine. As I stumble around trying to locate some kind of weapon, he lunges at me. Despite now missing both legs and an arm, he still manages to knock me down. He slams one fist down on my ankle and I can feel it nearly break. I kick his face with my other leg, but the effect seems to be negligible. I scramble backwards, and he lunges at me again, barely missing this time. Just as I think I'm absolutely done for, I can start to make out another set of raspy breaths behind me. I quickly turn around, seeing Chad standing there. Just like everybody else, he's beyond repair. 
While he's still standing on two legs, both of his arms are out of commission. One has been completely severed from the elbow down, and the other just lies limp at its side. However, he's still grasping the shotgun. He drops it to the ground and kicks it towards me. Fucking shoot him! I hastily grab at it and turn around just in time as Winston's preparing for another lunge. This time, I hit him square in the chest. His body bounces backwards before hitting a wall. For a moment, I think it's over. However, that hope quickly fades as Winston rapidly spins back around, now with a gaping hole in his upper body. What the hell? I find myself blurting out. No, not him! Chad screams. I turn to look at him again, seeing him raising a shaky finger somewhere to the right of me. I make a hurried attempt to pinpoint what exactly he's trying to point out, and then I see it. It's... another Winston. Also chained up. However, he doesn't seem to be starved like everybody else, retaining the same bulky frame that he had when I first met him. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the other Winston bounding towards me. Without more hesitation, I raise the gun and take a desperate shot. Since he was rather far away, the bullet spread this time, hitting about three others close to him. But one of them hits where it counts. The neck. As soon as the connection is made, the crippled Winston ceases movement. However, the other Winston bolts up, hands covering his leaking throat. He stumbles for a few moments before falling down. He looks over at me, an expression of pure hatred plastered on his face before ultimately going limp. As soon as this happens, the white screen at the other end also disappears. Chet lets out an exasperated sigh and slumps down with his back to the wall. For a moment, we simply say nothing. But he eventually breaks the silence. Kill your copy before it's too late. At first, I felt apprehension. Are you serious? Why? Just fucking do it. Winston wasn't a part of this world. You're not too late yet. Everybody else is, but you aren't. I waver for a few minutes. What happened here? I call out to him, but I get no response. I turn to look at his now lifeless body, slowly sliding down the wall. His head pivots slightly as it hits the floor, revealing a large gash to the back of his skull. I guess there's only one thing left to do here. My ankle hurts like hell, but I can still move it. I limp over to my own copy, examining it once more. This time, I notice the difference. My face isn't completely blank like the others, there's still some semblance of nearly indistinguishable expression still fighting its way outwards. I pick up the shotgun and slam it down on my temple. I do this until my breaths have ceased completely. I was expecting to feel something, but nothing changed. For a moment I consider doing the same to Sergio, but then I remember Chad's last words. You're not too late yet. Everyone else is, but you aren't. I do it anyway. Maybe there's still a chance for him. But maybe that's just wishful thinking. Before leaving, I fished Chad's keys out of his pocket. It felt a tad disrespectful, but I didn't know what else to do. I walk out the door and back down the corridors, with this feeling of relieved melancholy looming over me. At some point, I pass the suit, who appears to be torn in half at the torso. I don't know whether it was Chad or Winston that killed him. It doesn't really matter, though. Eventually, I found my way out. The crisp night air has never tasted so fresh. The buzzing sound is now gone. However, I'm not alone out here. I can spot about seven figures each standing at some point at the edge of the crumbs. It's not a mystery regarding what I have to do. 
As soon as I start running, the figures follow suit. I jump in and start the car with no time to spare. One of the figures slams into my side window. I don't look at it. I don't want to. I peel out of there. When I get home, the sun's starting to come up. I lock all my doors and shut all my blinds before passing out on the couch. When I wake up, eleven hours have elapsed. I'm feeling a lot better. I suppose the only thing that I really have to worry about at this point are the crop people. I might also have to deal with the cops. But we'll cross those roads when we get there. I've messaged Sergio, but he hasn't responded. But I'm safe for now, at least. I think. By the way, I just found a job posting in my local paper. $27 an hour for a barista. At the Dolus Cafe.